So today on the channel, I have a man who needs no introduction. He is talented, he's funny, he's educated, <laughs> probably overeducated. Uh, he's a public figure, um, and you'd know and love him as Z Dog MD. His name is Zubin Damania, and he's so generously and graciously agreed to actually let me interview him. Um, I've known him for approximately a year and a half. Um, we've become good friends. We've done a series of interviews about awakening, and the awakening topic is something that we both share as, as something we're deeply interested in, um, spirituality, uh, consciousness, the mind, etc. So I thought it would be a nice treat for uh, everybody who knows uh, Zubin and people who don't uh, to kind of go through a little bit about how he became who he is, how he became um, a physician, how he became interested in, in awakening and consciousness, um, any sort of shifts and in insight he's had, uh, how he became Z Dog MD, and, and how that's sort of played out in his life and so forth. So I think we're going to kind of go through all that, but I think it might be um, uh, best to just start uh, with uh, an introduction and, and just saying hello. What's up, man? That, I, listen, for me, this is like free therapy, Angelo, like with the master. <laughs> I'm just, I'm excited to be here. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, so yeah, I'm, I'm Zubin. Uh, I met Angela, like, like you said, about a year and a half, two years ago. And, and it's just been all downhill ever since into complete emptiness, <laughs> which is a good thing. Um, so yeah, yeah. When Angela said, maybe let's talk, I thought, oh, it's, 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 diff you know, it's weird. It's hard to talk about yourself in a way. And then in another way, it's the easiest thing in the world because that's the stories you've been telling yourself all your life are kind of those stories. Um, but yeah, I mean, I was, I was, um, both my parents are from India, but we're of a old Persian lineage, uh, called the Zoroastrians. It was like pre-Islamic Iran, Persia back in the day that that was us. And they kind of fled everywhere, uh, during the Muslim conquests. And my parents' family fled to India, you know, hundreds of years ago. And so they were born and raised there. Both of them are doctors, mother's a psychiatrist, father's an internist, and so they moved to New Jersey where I was born. And then at age eight, I moved from the snow, it, it, the armpit of, uh, of America, New Jersey, into the armpit of California, which is <laughs> Fresno, California. Clovis, California is like a rural farming town. And, and um, you know, my, my earliest memories are, are kind of that sense of um, having a sense that you're not, I, well, how do you even put this? Like this kind of, uh, there's more to reality than what we see. Uh, it kind of, I felt that even when I was very young. And so that's why I got very interested in science and plants and, and insects and all those kind of things. And so when I was in New Jersey, I would always go in the woods and kind of dig stuff up and poke under holes and things like that. And then when I got to, to Clovis, it was going out in the orchard because we lived on a little land out in the sticks and, and my parents are still there. And, and then poking through my dad's medical textbooks and, and that sort of thing and trying to figure out what was up. But I was like a kind of ahead of the curve back then. Even then I had like childhood obesity before it was like the cool thing to have. <laughs> so I was like this chubby little kid with this like New Jersey accent and, you know, two Indian parents, funny last name. And so I was picked on quite a bit. So to put myself at ease, I would always try to, and the fact that I was a big nerd, like I loved astronomy and like had a telescope, was always trying to peek, poke into things, uh, to make myself feel safe, actually. I think it was a sense of insecurity, like I'm in danger, right? I would uh, use humor. So I started becoming the kid who was like the weird kid who would make jokes a lot. But the idea was to kind of put people at a little bit of a distance and kind of control the relationship a little bit. So mm -hmm. that's where that sort of fixation around humor maybe started. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a kind of upbringing where you always felt a little bit like the outsider and had interests that didn't seem to really align with a lot of other people. And it kind of started like yeah. that. Yeah. So I didn't grow up with physician parents, but I can imagine, you know, ha having grown up in that environment, you're probably far more interested in, in science and, and that sort of thing than, than maybe your peer group would be generally speaking. Um, d were you interested in medicine as a kid? Did your parents like encourage you or discourage you from, from medicine or anything like that? Or did you didn't even think about it? It was funny, man. So my dad would always be like, don't do medicine, go into business because business is where the money is. 
and uh, you know, look at this guy. He's driving Lexus. You're, I'm driving Camry, right? I'm seeing patients all day, primary care. So actually, both of them had this kind of sense that medicine was changing quite a bit, and uh, it was really hard. And I think they didn't want to see their kid. I'm the oldest of of three. They didn't want to see their kid kind of suffer in the way that they had had to suffer because they trained in India. Then they had to come here train again. And then it was the kind of scrabbling for patients and private practice that they did and just working, working, working. And my earliest memories of the word, even the word work has this connotation in my mind. It's almost like an image of, of suffering. And uh, mm. that was because I would see my parents go through all this, you know, hardship. So I think they kind of projected this feeling of like, hey, if there's anything else you could do other than medicine and also make a lot of money, right? Because that, that was the mm. whole thing is like security. Uh, like you have yeah. to have money or else you're going to be living on the street, um, then you should mm -hmm. do it. Um, and I think when eventually it became clear that there wasn't anything else, <laughs> they started, then they started really pushing like, hey, you know, medicine's not a bad way to go. Interesting. Yeah. So when you mentioned that you had like some sort of a version or at least a, a, a sort of perception that maybe have a little negative connotation with work, did you find yourself in any part of your upbringing being like, rebellious or the one who didn't want to work or didn't want to do schoolwork or how did that how that play out for you yeah it's really it's funny that's a good question it's very paradoxical because yes uh the oppositional defiant aspects of my personality really bloomed very early and some of it was because i never felt like i quite fit into this whatever this is and second is that you know i would see again the the standard way people did life and it seemed so abhorrently painful. Like, why would we even exist if our if our role in this world is to just slog away at a thing that doesn't seem to make sense and and that kind of mm -hmm. thing? And so I, I sort of vowed early on. And in fact, if you look at um, like yearbooks from like fourth grade, um, my mom kept these, these little pamphlet yearbooks with our crappy little images and kids would sign them in the back. And, 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 and it said the signatures were all like, hey, have a great summer, weirdo, like um, <laughs> have fun being a famous singer. Like, cause that's what I told them I wanted to do. Like, no, I, yeah. d the grind is not for me, bro. Like I've, I'm destined for greatness. Like it was this kind of delusion. And it was partially mm -hmm. a reaction to seeing how my parents played by all the rules, but they were just, it was brutal. So I think mm. that did start quite early on that I had these kind of delusions that there's got to be another way to be in the world that feels more authentic and is and, and that manifests as an oppositional like, uh, ah, I'm going to do the bare minimum to get through school. And it just so happened that public school in those days wasn't that hard. So you could actually do the, the bare minimum, at least with whatever, you know, luck of genetics I had that I could do the this, this subjects they were teaching. And it only got harder later when you actually had to apply yourself. Yeah. So a couple of things came up when you were um, describing that that I thought to ask about. One is um, the oh, you, you mentioned that it was delusional. And and I know that's kind of tongue in cheek, but the truth of it is y you seem most natural to me when you're when you're performing in certain ways or you're uh, f functioning in the sort of public space like you do. You just you're a natural at it. So it's amazing to me sometimes that kids actually have the instinct of what they're really going to do or what their talents really are even though they, they later like maybe doubt that and, and, and try to do something more traditional. But for you, it, it seemed to have come out anyway, which it, is cool. That's a, that's a funny observation because I'll tell you at the time, I wouldn't have thought it was, the word delusion wouldn't have made any sense to me. I would have been like, no, this is what I'm gonna do. Like you, mm -hmm. I had a deep instinct that like, whatever the standard thing is that people do when they grow up and go to work, that's not me and it can't be me. And mm -hmm. if it's gonna be me, I might as well just check out because that's not gonna, that's yeah. just not gonna happen. Then later, I'll apply the word delusional because, oh, in, this, in the context of everything I know now, that was clearly like, who, who, who does that? Like, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. But really, what was actually the authentic feeling was probably the kids mm -hmm. feeling that now that this is, yeah. a, it's a path is different. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I can totally relate to that. The idea that like, if I'm going to grow up, follow the rules the way I'm, the model shows me to follow the rules the way my parents are like people. And I, I knew people were miserable. I just could feel it, you know? And so to me, yeah, it, there was nothing less appealing than just 
following those rules. I didn't get it. And, and I think you had a sort of in, inspiring maybe talent for, for performance or something. I don't think I had any of that. <laughs> I didn't have anything I felt, which is great, actually. It's perfect because it was it was just a cauldron of misery. <laughs> and there was no other way for me except I had to wake up. But uh, we're not talking about me. So, um, But I can totally, totally relate to that feeling of this, this sort of a dysphoria when you go, you just feel like you're narrowed down into this shoehorn of this is what life is. Kind of sucks, but that's okay. It sucks for all of us. Just just go along. You know, go along with the program, right? Um, the other thing that came up to, for me to ask was you mentioned the singing thing. I'm going to be a singer. Um, or, or you said that the kids kids would notice that you you have this thing about singing. Was singing different for you than comedy? Like you mentioned the getting people to laugh had a certain function for you initially, maybe, but did those go together or did you, or do you just feel more naturally inclined to sing or? Yeah, it's interesting. In, in those days, it was that um, my interest wasn't so much in comedy. My interest was in listening to music and a lot of pop music, especially in those days. So I would, because I was, it was weird. I had these weird existential fears actually when I was a kid. And so I was actually quite scared of the dark, weirdly, even into like, 13, 14, uh, I, when I would go to bed in my own room, because I had my room, um, I would try to crack the door. And then when that got old, because you're becoming a, you know, get, entering your teen years, I would close the door, but I had a, um, I had a radio, like a clock radio at the bedside that had a countdown snooze function that would play music for 60 minutes. And so I would play a radio station as I went to bed. And so I was just obsessed with pop music. And in those days it was like, mm. it was the quirkier pop music that, because again, I felt a little oppositional and I felt like whatever was super popular, well, that just isn't me. It didn't feel quite right. So it was like men at work and like, uh, cause mm. they were like a little, and I remember some kid was like trying to tease me or bully me in school because he's like, you like men at work? What are you like? You know, and he drops the R word and all the other stuff that you can't say anymore. And um, I was like, there's just something weird about these Australian guys that sing about stuff that I don't even understand. And uh, so singing became a kind of a aspirational thing. Like, wow, wouldn't it be cool to be able to do mm -hmm. that? And the comedy thing was more like, oh, that's just what I do to keep from getting my ass kicked, you know, like mm -hmm. you just, and and in a way the in, in those days, when I was young, I think, the humor thing felt almost like a like an affliction, like a weirdness, like there's something off with me. Uh, that was the word people would use to describe me. He's a weird kid. There's just something not quite right with him. Uh, and and then being smart on top of that made it even kind of more uh, dangerous socially to kind of embrace those sort of things. All the things that make you a great performer in in public or in an adult life, right? I'm sure. I'm sure. Anyone who's listening to this, who who does performance for a living, you know, who's a musician professionally, I'm sure they relate to that. Uh, you know, I'm sure it made you feel different to to just have those kinds of inclination. I think now people are much more um, kids are are more uh, taught uh, to be accepting of different styles and different interests in other children and stuff like that. But when we were growing up, it wasn't so much like that. No, you were, you were the outlier, right? And now you know, there's yeah. a kind of an in baked narcissism to 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 uh, the society in that oh if you have those talents go on and on Instagram and you can bypass the circuitry of the machine and become sure. a, you know become an influencer and be rich and so it's almost like a pathological sort of shift in in how you look at it yeah. it used to be yeah, like you said it was a liability now it's like oh you're great but for all the kind of shallow wrong reasons um Society yeah. has not fixed itself. <laughs> That's the punchline. Well, the, the beautiful and strange and, and sort of tragic thing about ego that we'll end up talking about and, and um, the collective ego, the collective delusion is it's, it's quite flexible. It's very, it's, it's flexible. It's mm. good at hiding. Um, it's, it's a, it's the ultimate opportunist and you see it not only in your own psyche, uh, the more you dig in, the more you'll see it, of course, but you see it in the sort of communal psyche, the, the social uh, trends and and the way you know whatever you see a lot of times in politics the more the more polarized politics gets the more strangely the the, the most extreme sides start acting kind of kind of similar in very strange ways and in a lot, very fearful and stuff um but anyway so so yeah it's very interesting about the existential fears as well one time you and i were having a conversation you mentioned something and i said i remember that exact thing happening to me you said that you were watching TV with the whole family 
And so all of a sudden, the whole scene of like, watching people perform on TV and everybody outside the TV, watching the people on the inside of the TV watch. And it just felt completely bizarre and weird. And you like flipped off the TV screen and walked and walked out of the room or something like that. It, it, it was one of my, one of my earliest memories of horror of just abject terror was that we were watching Elvis and it was my parents were watching on the little square screen. It must've been in the seventies sometime in New Jersey. And something just horrified me of the whole thing, like you said. And and I clicked off the TV and for, I don't know, a couple months, I would not, anytime someone tried to turn on the TV, I would lose my shit and just, and, and try to turn it off. And my dad was just beside himself. He's like, what's going on with this kid? Um, and I, I, I couldn't put my finger on what it was, but it was so terrifying. Um, so these kind of unexplained terrors. You know, I can totally relate. And I've thought back on what that is. And so I never had an, an episode where I like shut off the TV or anything, but I, I remember times sort of standing on the, almost like the side of the living room, just watching what's happening and seeing like my parents transfixed in this like sort of zombie state, looking at this TV, seeing not real people in that TV screen doing things and being like, un, like in an unnatural way, like transfixed onto that illusion. And now I look at it, I'm like, oh, that's, that's the outward reflection of the ego. We're looking at the internal movie screen of our mind all day long. That's why it's so easy for screens to capture our attention because it very much reflects our internal world, which is a false world. The wow. world of separation, the world of me and my problems and relational um, you know, experiences with what feels like everything separate from me. And so we've externalized our ego into everything, right? Screens and social media. It's really fascinating and Looking back, I think that's what was so weird about it for me, but I would have never been able to articulate that. I could just feel it. There's something bizarre going on here, you know? That's fascinating. Yeah. I, I think I, I resonate yeah. with that quite a bit. And especially looking at social media now, like you said, it is this external progression of our internal uh, screen and, and kind of the structure of consciousness just made explicit. So our left mm -hmm. hemisphere can really see it and understand it. And, and it's always there. And it's very disconcerting when you're, <laughs> especially when you're young and you're not conditioned as much. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If you think of like certain, say, Instagram models or whatever, where it's just, it's endless numbers of selfies, right? That's, that's actually a function of the brain. It's a function of the default mode network. It's the theory of mind, mm -hmm. where you can actually picture yourself from the outside. And you're doing that internally, like imagining how you're looking all the time. And you're like, oh, well, that's what's going on in inwardly. Let me just reproduce that on the outside world for everyone else to see. <laughs> And never, right? I mean, in, throughout human history, we've not really be, been able to do that at scale unless you have artistic talent. You can do a self portrait yeah. or something. Now it's like weaponized everywhere. Yeah. You can just absolutely do yeah. it. It's like, it's, you're right. It's like almost like a default m mode network by proxy where you've made it explicit what you're seeing in the internal. Ooh, yeah. man. Yeah. Interesting. We're external. It, it, some of it's really cool. Some of it's really bizarre. And some of it potentially is, you know, harmful and, yeah. and addictive and so forth. But uh, anyway, yeah, externalizing the mental processes and AI and all of it now. So, mm. but that's a tangent. Let's talk about, let's talk about the Z pup. Now, when the Z pup started to get to that, like, teen year, right, Those t the early teen years and, and puberty and, you know, becoming socially aware, interested in, whatever else that you become interested in when you're 13, 14, 15 years old. Like, what was life like for you when you were moving to your teen years? You know, I, 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 I'm reflecting back on it. At the time, of course, you don't really know what's going on, but there, you know, you got the flood of hormones and everything and you're trying, you know, you're, you're very confused in general. But what I think was happening with me is I started looking for identity. Like, what am I in terms of, this construct of society because the construct of society started to really reify itself as something that's absolutely real. So where, what's my role in that? And this is an existential question because uh, how are you gonna survive if you don't know who you are in this setting? So I actually started trying on different outfits of personality, of, of identity, and, and I did it quite consciously. And, and um, you know, it's funny because looking back, you know, at, at the time, if I had ever said this, I would have been called out as the exact poser that I was. Um, but I was like, you know what? Uh, freshman year high school, I'm gonna be a skater. That's what I wanna do. I like that whole thing. I'm just gonna do that. So I went and bought a skateboard like off some kid. And I was like, I'll learn to skate. But really more importantly, I will learn how to dress and act and hang out 
with the skaters because that's the identity that I that I want to assume. So I'd go to the you know wavelength surf shop and buy the Stussy pants and the shirt that had the Powell Peralta and the you know have you seen him like uh, 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 skate video and all this stuff and the. And, and I wore that like an identity. And the real skaters knew that I was a complete poser. They were like, this guy sucks, right? But then I found some friends who were also posers. And then we just by mm-hmm. by pure force of will started getting good at skateboarding. <laughs> and then you go from being a complete poser like wannabe to actually being a decent skater and really inhabiting the culture. But you're trying it on as a coat. And, um, and, then, and then when that coat feels not right. Then you try a different coat on like, oh, I got, I, you know what? I want to play guitar because I really love music. Maybe I'll do that, but I'm going to go with all the trappings of the guy who plays electric guitar. And so you try that coat on. And again, it's mm. all this kind of desperate attempt to find a niche in the social sort of hierarchy, the social pecking order when, you know, you're a short little fat kid, although I'd lost weight at that point, uh, really didn't fit in and had interests that were not like, didn't, I still to this day don't know what football is. I don't even know what it is. Like I couldn't tell you the rules. Like, and that was devastating when you grow up in a, you know, farming town where like sports and our, even our high school was all about sports and all that. So I had to find a thing that would, that would provide a sense of safety, security, and identity. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, I can totally relate to that as well. I mean, I did a couple sports here and there, but I was never really like great at it. I never was passionate about it. And I didn't, fu- I don't fully understand a lot of sports myself, but I, what I don't really don't understand is when you suddenly find yourself in a group of men and they're talking about the game that happened last night and they're like, what do you think of the game? And I'm going, okay, what sport could they even be talking about? What season is it? Is there a Super Bowl? Did the world series just happen? I never know what the heck people are talking about, you know, but, uh, um, so I can totally relate to that. The other thing that's fascinating about that, trying on different identities, um, I think of a few things. Like one is very distinctly, uh, it was so f- interesting. I was a manager of a Domino's pizza store 25 years ago, somewhere in Colorado. And one of my drivers was this like 16 year old kid. And I remember he would, and we were in a kind of a rural place and he would come in. He was always like cowboy. He had a chew, chew, you know, can circle in the back pocket. He had Wranglers. He had cowboy boots. He had a cowboy hat. Come in, change into his Domino's uniform and leave. And I swear he walked like a cowboy, talked like a cowboy. I figured this kid just grew up on a farm somewhere and that's all he did. And that's all he knew. And, you know, I knew this kid like that for like six months. And all of a sudden one day he came in, he was a gangster rapper, (laughs) like talking different, hat crooked, just dressed completely, I mean, like overnight. Not, it wasn't like a slow transition. I was like, that's what teenagers do. They just try on different, you know, I, I, I was like, I tried not, I was like, okay, I'm not gonna tease him because it's, it's just, it was so abrupt and so like, whoa, you know, but then again, who, who's really full of crap? The, the, the people who actually have solidified their identities and believe their identities or the teenagers that's just like, okay, well, let me just try to fit in and try this one and try that one, knowing that they're kind of not that real anyway. So they're, they're probably more authentic maybe than, than once the identity is actually solidified. <laughs> um, so yeah, that, and, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Like that's fascinating. Yeah. That, that abrupt, that abrupt shift, that's what people would have seen in me. They would have been like, what? He like in eighth grade, he was this kid and now he's this kid like overnight. Like what happened in the summer? You know, mm-hmm. it is, it's this kind of, you know, so you actually worked at Domino's as a manager. Like was that yeah. pre Noid or intra Noid era of Domino's? It was, it was actually just after the Noid was retired and we were all really sad about it. Do you know why the Noid was retired? No. It's a crazy story. I didn't know this until I read it on Wikipedia like in the last year. I was always a freaking mystery. Why would they get rid of the Noid? He was so cool. Everyone liked him. He was a cool character. He was funny. But the reason was there was a guy whose last name was Noid and he got like obsessed with the Noid or something. And he like he either killed himself or he killed someone. Like he committed some violent crimes. And so Domino's corporate was like, man, I guess we got to just drop the Noid. You know, this, this Noid guy went berserko. Uh, anyway, it's some Dude, strange thing like that. But- see- I would have I would have used the office space defense there. I would have said, "Wait, why should we change our name? He's the one that sucks." You know what I mean? <laughs> totally. <laughs> the Michael so we Bolton. Had this, yeah, so we had this store, and we found this old Noid costume in the back, and the the like area supervisor's like, "Well, you can't use that anymore. It's not Domino's corporate." And we're like, Pfft. 
So we'd get it out and we'd play it. We'd like go out in the street. I would give the craziest kid in my store, like the, the one kid who loved to perform. He's like, I want to get that Noid costume on, man. I'd send him out on the street and he'd be running around the street, like pretending he's jumping in front of cars, like really crazy stuff. But it was so funny. And of course, we didn't have cameras, phones back then, so we couldn't record it. But oh. it would have been awesome to Oh, record. man. But he, it was fun. So we had this huge full-size Noid costume we play, played in. So You were living the dream, man. Dude, dude, it's fun. <laughs> yeah, did. you know. Did you ever work in, when you were a teenager, did you ever work in any kind of restaurant um, situation in high school or anything? My, my parents wouldn't let me because they assumed that I needed all my uh, brain width to do school, which I actually was sitting around my, on my ass most of the time. <laughs> Like watching TV. I watched TV. That's the other thing about high school and, and school. TV, 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 round the clock. We talk about screens now. I was glued. I had a TV in my room, little 19-inch Sony Trinitron, and I would watch that shit all day, every day when I wasn't working or whatever. Even when I was doing schoolwork, the TV was on. It was Dukes of Hazard, or it was Fantasy Island, or it was you know, the A-Team or whatever. And I think that that kind of created also an unconscious kind of conditioning of pop culture and and the kind of performance mm. of TV, the way people, the way TV kind of presents itself as these kind of little snippets of real hyper real reality, you know, su super normal stimulus. Totally. So you're you're like me when you watch Family Guy and you see those obscure references from the '80s, you know the word, you know them word for word instantly. You remember the music, you know the words to the stupid jingles. Yeah, all yeah. of it. Yeah, it's kind of disturbing yeah. actually how conditioned yeah. we are. Like that's all unconscious. It's all there still. <laughs> yeah. Remember when we were talking about Skylab? <laughs> oh my God. That, that, that was where I knew, because you know, we had just barely met. And one of our early conversations was, yeah, do you remember Skylab, the orbiting thing, right? And <laughs> at some point the news was saying, this thing is going to tumble to earth. We don't know where it's going to fall. <laughs> and both, I think both you and I had this existential terror that it was going to fall on us. Yep. Yeah, yeah, of course. Like when you when you think like when you're a kid, you're just like complete walking around ego, right? So when you picture it falling, you picture it falling on you. <laughs> of course. And my mom's like, you know, it's a space station. It's coming apart. It's gonna fall out of the sky. But I'm like, will it hit us? And she's like, probably not. And I'm like, oh, okay, you know. And I kind of walk out of the room. I'm like, wait a minute. What does she mean by probably not? <laughs> like maybe she's just like softening the blow, and like my life is gonna end in the next week, and I'm, and she knows it. Dude, you you, you 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 actually you nailed it on the when you're a kid, it's all kind of everything is centered around you. Yeah, that was it. Like you're gonna be famous, you're gonna win the lottery, you're gonna uh, get hurt in some way, you're gonna have Skylab fall on you. It really feels like that. Mm. Yeah. So you became um, you became a teenager. You became a young adult. And at what point did you decide I'm going to go to med school? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was doing guitar as a teenager and I thought, you know, this is a thing I can do because I can apply kind of diligence to it. It's got some uh, technique and I, it, it combines uh, my desire to perform and, and be validated externally with um, my love of music and the kind of science around like there's a science to music and a kind of structure to it. And so when I, when I went to UC Berkeley for my undergraduate, I thought, okay, well, what should I do? Because um, becoming a professional musician is, you know, I was reasonably sharp enough to know that that was a low probability affair because as I'm getting older, I'm starting to get that conditioning that's like, you know, the science of this says you're unlikely to succeed financially if you become a musician. And then, you know, your dad will be right. You're going to live on the street, right? Like my dad used to say, "You being a professional clown won't put naan on the table. <laughs> and, and, um, and he's right. So I was like, okay, I'll do a, I'll do a molecular biology major and kind of hedge because then I could go to grad school. I could do medicine. I could do whatever. And then I'll do a music minor. And so I thought it was going to be a performance music minor, but I ended up doing ethnomusicology, which is the study of the music of other cultures, which that actually was so weirdly compelling to me, you know, studying like Javanese gamelan playing or the music of the Caribbean or how like pre-animistic African religions like infused uh, the music of St. Lucia, you know, like stuff mm. like that became fast. And then going back to European music and taking a whole class on Beethoven and going, that mother flipper was beyond this earth, like uh, mm. transcendent, like the connection to that romantic era music of 
he's almost channel, channeling the divine. And I, and I, I was an atheist, right? <laughs> like there's something yeah. about this guy. And so the music kind of, uh, kept that connection to the sublime or the, 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 the kind of ineffable, you can't put it in words kind of thing. And so I thought, oh, you know, that, I'll, I'll do that. And then it became clear that I just didn't have the drive, the talent, the ambition, um, the looks, any of that to, to be a professional musician. <laughs> and that's when I started like kind of getting more drawn by the curiosity of the sciences. Like, wow, you know, like you might be able to explain the world here or at least keep going until we can't explain anymore and then go further, like keep. So mm. science kind of was that proxy for the explanatory gap of like, what is this? Um, which had been kind of going from when I was very young. And, and I know you've had that too. It's like, what the hell is this? Like even this, yeah. th just this, I, I, I can't explain it at all. And, and yet there was, always, you know, so you're like, oh, science. Yeah, of course, consciousness just emerges from the complexity of the brain. Let's figure out how that happens. And that was like a huge drive. So I thought I'd go into medicine and kind of, you know, uh, kind of dive into that. And I was always like, oh, but I won't be like my parents. I'm not going to do primary care. I'm not going to do psych. I'm not going to be miserable like my parents. I'm going to find the hack, the cheat code to do it and just be super happy, you know? So that, that was me coming mm. out of college. Yeah. Yeah. And so when you were going, so going into medical school, you really didn't know what specialty you were interested in or anything like that. I thought I would do GI, gastroenterology. Mm. And the reason was I liked the, I love GI physiology. I just thought it was so interesting that so much of what happens in our body is completely unseen. And yet we could understand it um, and actually help people with these different conditions. And, and I like the video game aspect of colonoscopy and that kind of thing. In theory, I was like, oh, this is great. You go in, it's like, you know, it's like Star Wars, you know, wedge, get out of, get, get out of there. You can't do any more good back there. You know, like flying through the trench of the colon and all that. Um, and so that was my thing thought is like, that would be the specialty that where I'd be happy because you make decent money, but you're doing something you like and so on. And then I did the rotation and I was like, this is terrible. Like mm. it's just poo everywhere. Like I love poo as much as the next guy, but like, this is a different level. And yeah. uh, I realized the rep repetitiveness of the job was um, almost mind numbing for, for me. I was always looking for novelty too. That was the other thing. Like, what's the next thing I'll do? I was a serial hobbyist, yeah. like, oh, I'm interested in this. Now I'm interested in this. And I thought, mm. oh, I can't do that for the rest of my life. Um, so then it was kind of this existential crisis of what do I do? Yeah. You know, I don't know if I ever told you I was a GI tech for about five years, like kind of, kind of a GI lab manager for about five years before med school. Like Domino's, um, but with poo. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I went. I literally went directly from Domino's to the GI lab. That was that was my did, career. Did you, transition. did you have a mascot called the Roid? <laughs> <laughs> we should have. We Slow should've. hanging fruit. Yeah. <laughs> freaking awesome. No, that's oh man, that's good. So, but I, I was gonna say um, when you talk about the video games and stuff, it, it's interesting. I one of the uh, docs I worked with. So, so when you're a gastroenterologist, one of the things that happens, like three times a day, four times a day is one of the patients you're doing a procedure on will go, how did you get into this? Cause you know, they're having a colonoscopy. So they're like, why do you want to go in people's butts every day? So it's just a thing everyone asks. Right. And one of the docs used to always say the same thing. He'd just go, I was just always good at video games. And, and he meant it. He's like, I was, I was good. At, I liked it. I liked, you know, the control and the screen and all that stuff. And, but this other doc was really funny. He always say low self-esteem. <laughs> that's see, that's a brutally honest answer. I yeah. was like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He's, he's just, yeah. He was just being a you know, wise guy. But uh, um, okay. And so when you were going through medical school, was it, was it sort of like your, your relief valve to, to play guitar, practice, perform? Were you doing performance at that point? Any kind of live or public performance? Yeah, what I would do, we would um, kind of perform just locally, you know, for our dorm and stuff. But then I, would, I started teaching guitar. And mm -hmm. this was a weird thing because I'd never really done formal, formal teaching. Although one of my, one of my earliest memories actually of, of like second grade or so when I was back in New Jersey, we, I was in a private school before when I moved to the West Coast, they put me in a public school. And so in the private school, they actually valued curiosity and the kind of um, nerdy stuff that I was kind of into. And I remember they had us do a talk on something we're crazy about. And I was crazy about Venus flytraps, those uh, carnivorous plants. And so I stood up, it was the evening, I remember it was dark and all the parents were there in the class and I had to give a presentation in second grade about this Venus flytrap. 
And man, I, I, all I remember, it was probably an incorrect memory, but it, I crushed that presentation. Like I was talking about mm. how these things can photosynthesize, but they don't need to because they have this carnivorous aspect and this is how plants work. And this is how the sensitive fibers that detect pressure change this osmotic thing and it causes the things to close. And I, and I got a standing ovation from this class of parents for this talk. And I remember going, wow, that felt better than anything I've ever felt in my life. That, that being able to kind of teach and experience the fact that people actually learn from it. And so when I was in college, I started teaching guitar for like, you know, 10 bucks an hour or whatever for kids who wanted to do it. You know, you put those sheets up with the little pull tags with your phone number on it, like guitar. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And you, and, and you, and you'd see how many had, had taken them. And I'm like, oh, a bunch of people took these little tabs. You get this little rush of dopamine. It's like the early like and dislike on social media, it was like you put up a flyer and people pulled out the tabs. I got so many likes. And so I would do that. And that was how I got really interested in teaching. Because it's like, it's one thing to be able to do something. It's another thing to be able to actually impart that knowledge to somebody who's way better than you, ultimately, in terms of talent. And so that mm -hmm. was something that I picked up in college was the teaching aspect of it. Yeah. I mean, anyone who knows you, who's seen your program, uh, I think would, would agree with this statement. It's something I told you almost right after I met you. Uh, you, you ha I mean, you have obviously have a lot of talents, but, but you have a, a particularly acute and, and adept talent of taking something complex or obscure and presenting it in a, a very simple, direct, accessible way, digestible way, and with a, with a sort of fun personality to do it. Like you, that, that sort of, I don't know, conglomeration of talents, you, you are a natural at and, and you know, so anyway, well, I just thought I would acknowledge that. But. Oh, I mean, that's nice of you. I, I would say this though, I think some of that again was conditioning from youth where, you know, later someone pointed this out to me very directly that, that this is your way of feeling safe is using the kind of humor and the thing to try to teach people and so on. And it's in a way it's, it's controlling that interaction to some degree, but then later as you grow into it, you realize, oh, it's actually, that, that's a good thing to be able to do um, if you're trying to do some good in the world, you know? Sure, yeah. So the other thing I, I wanted to ask you because we kind of zoomed past it, I forgot to ask you, uh, you don't have to go into any detail about this if you don't want to, but I, I, I've seen you talk about it publicly in videos before. Did you not have some experience, I think in undergrad, or someone gave you a certain substance to it, <laughs> smoke or something. And, and maybe, I don't know if it happened more than once, but you wanna talk about that at all? So, okay. So, <laughs> I think this is, actually, this is actually important because up till age 18, I had never done anything untoward in terms of drugs, alcohol, any of that, because Nancy Reagan, growing up Central Valley, two immigrant Indian parents, like I'm living in their house. There's no way I'd get away with it. And my friends were actually <clears throat> kind of nerds and you know they were guitar nerds like into Iron Maiden and all that, but it's weird they never really got drunk or smoked weed or did any of that stuff. And so, and this, these were the days of cocaine and all kinds of stuff in the eighties and, and everybody had acid and ecstasy and all that in the school, but I would, it was crazy. I was like, you can just die. Like one time, you'll just die. Because, you know, because you watch enough Nancy Reagan, you watch enough after school specials, you know, you're, you're like, I'm not going to do that. So I go to Berkeley, like, and this is just predestined. It's Berkeley. Live in the dorms, bunch of kids. We're free for the first time. These kids are a bunch of stoners, uh, some of them. And uh, this one kid who now in retrospect, I realized he was like a, the unusual libertarian, like kind of very off the bell curve at Berkeley and just a very smart question, very curious, would question everything. And he's like, yeah, we're smoking some weed tonight. You wanna come? And I was like, oh, you mean marijuana? Uh. And then I was like, there was an overwhelming curiosity. Like, wait, now this is probably my chance to try this thing once. I don't think it's gonna kill me. It's like the weakest of the drugs. Nothing bad will happen. Probably nothing will happen, period, right? So we go- it's like Kevin Costner of drugs. Exactly. It's the water world uh, of, of drugs, you know, like a, a total flop, like <laughs> extremely expensive, but also, yeah. So, so uh, we're in the dorm room. I, I remember this and he's like, okay, this is how you work this bong. You know, you, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll light it for you. Cause you're an idiot and you hold the little thing here. And then when you're done, I'll pull it up for you and the smoke will go up in your lungs. And I'm like, oh, cool. So I see the smoke and then I just, and I start coughing uncontrollably, of course, because I've never even smoked anything in my life. The next thing I know, there's a gap in perception 
where a whole part of my life has just disappeared. And then suddenly I'm back in the world and things are moving in like frames. Like uh, time is just, is distorted in a way that I can't, it's indescribable. And there's this uh, ineffable kind of space between everything that's a kind of empty, alive awakeness. And I, and I remember at the time I was just, people are around me staring at me like, when's he gonna talk again? And I was just like, I'm seeing the fourth dimension, you guys. Like, what, what even is this? Like, what's even going on right now? And I have never in my life been that altered as I was after that first hit of, of weed. And so something in my physiology responded to it instantly. And I was just launched into absolute, like that consciousness could do that was a revelation to me. Like I, immediately mm-hmm. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> like this is so beyond the confines of what I thought the mind was that, mm-hmm. yeah. And of course, you know, my friends just were like, you were out of your mind. Like you were saying things that were just off the wall and like, but I remember it. Like, I, I mean, I remember yeah. quite a bit of it. And that was my first glimpse into, oh, there's something in the fabric of our knowing of reality that is very much beyond the standard conventional way of mind. And and it actually made sense suddenly. I'm like, oh, I think I understand what they were talking about in the 60s. Like why that culture mm-hmm. was so interesting like in a way that I could never have understood had I not had I not done that. And so that was kind of the crack. And then later in college, I you know dabbled in LSD and psilocybin and mushrooms. And again, the same thing, just, just a different level of like, what is, wow, um, ineffable, yeah. can't describe it, but something realer than real, it felt like. Yeah, I can, I, I can relate very, very directly to that. Um, the first time I smoked pot, Strangely, the first time I smoked pot, I didn't do anything at all. And I don't, someone, someone told me that can happen. They said sometimes it just happens and doesn't mean you're immune to it. The next time you may get high. It's common. Or something. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I remember really just not feeling anything. The second time I smoked it, it was exactly what you described where it was like, I, the way I remember it was like in story blocks. Like all of a sudden what I felt like a solid reality of me was came apart into story blocks and frames. And the space between the frames, so to speak, was ineffable. It was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay. What was this? It was awesome. I loved it. I thought this was super cool. Me too. It was, it came, it was very peaceful. There was no dysphoria with it. And then very quickly after that, anytime I tried to smoke pot, it turned into something other than that. It was very uncomfortable paranoia. Like you, you could say like the emotion blocks came to the surface or something and I didn't know what that was or whatever. But, uh, but yeah, that, that was like a, almost a one-time experience for me. However, with other, with like LSD, it was different. The first time I took LSD, it was, I was that gap was every, the whole thing was a gap. There was nothing left. Like it was, it was like a three hour gap of nothingness. And I can't even tell you how it felt. There was no reflection, self-reflection for quite a while. Uh, afterwards it was like, Whoa, okay, damn, you know, but also some of my instinct told me like, I don't need to find this in drugs anymore. Not that I didn't try a little bit, but yeah. it was, it was kind of knowing that like, you know, whatever this is, it's not, it's not something that's being caused by the drug. A drug can't do that. It's all, it's got to already be that way. It was so real. It has to already be that way. The drug did something to my brain or something, you know? Uh, anyway. That, that's actually, cool. that's, that's a powerful point. A microgram gram quantity of LSD, <clears throat> like this is a homeopathic dose of a drug, can alter your reality so fundamentally in a way that feel, it feels realer than real. And, and uh, that that you know there's something underlying that. And that became clear. It was like a pointer where you get a peek behind the veil of reality and go, oh, that's there. And it never leaves you. It's kind of like it, it generates a kind of a faith. But it was the same with me. I was like, this is not a thing for me. And, and part of the reason was, and I, I can only understand this in retrospect, when you said weed later became more dysphoric and so on, S- same thing for me. What would happen is I think the ego started to co-opt the experience of the drug experience and be like, oh, I'm gonna have a drug experience now and it's gonna be great and it's gonna relieve this suffering that I have during the day, whether it's boredom, suffering or anxiety or whatever, and I'm gonna project into the space. And then all what would happen is the, the, the state of the drug would then allow ego to reflect on itself and there was a lot of like this self-hatred and like, man, I really am a piece of shit. Like, wh- God, what is this guy that walks around thinking yeah. he's this? And and it just became so unpleasant that I was like, this is not a thing for me to do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
it, it felt it felt kind of to me like that um, that sometime in childhood when you started getting those experiences of dysphoria, existential fear, something it felt like that, but like but like solidified and more like 10 times and right in the middle of your, your head, like you can't get out of it. And you're like, Jesus, you know? So it's very interesting reflecting back on it because it wasn't something bad. The drug did to me. It was for whatever reason, the, the set of conditions, which in that case was a drug w was able to actually show me how dysfunctional, pervasive, heavy, and dense the ego actually is mm. and how goddamn uncomfortable it is. So mm. as bad as it felt, it was probably just as important as the other breakthrough type experiences as far as insight is concerned, I would say. I agree. Um, yeah, I agree. Yeah. yeah, it shows you something about the nature of your mind where you're like, oh, yeah, yeah. So I have one more question, then we're going to go into the bonus round. Then we're going to jump back into all this cool uh, spiritual awakening type stuff. So the, <laughs> the last question of this section is coming out of those experiences, the, the sort of drug experiences or whatever, uh, marijuana experience, and then maybe some hallucinogens with the openings and the, the uh, frame coming apart a little bit and all that sort of thing. Did you have a, a knowing um, instinct that like, I, whatever that was, I'm going to find it again, or I'm going to orient my life to it? Or, or is it just kind of like, huh, that was a weird thing that happened and, and didn't really draw a conclusion that that's going to somehow be something I'm going to continue to investigate in the future? Yeah, you know, I haven't really thought about this in years. I would say um, it was such a compelling experience that it was it was so life changing. Like it changes the direct the the direction of your life in the sense that everything you thought was real actually is now on some shaky ground. You're like, wait, and in fact, <clears throat> you know, when because I, I, I ever since I was like twelve and I was having the bar mitzvah equivalent for Zoroastrians where you you know you have a little ceremony and the priests pray over you and all that and and I had the kind of the pers kind of persistence of a kind of magical thinking that if I just pray you know this benevolent God will do things for me and so on and that started to dissolve you know 12 13 years old I had been you know what a self-described atheist well there isn't really a God like that um but there was always an assumption that but then what is it? Like, is it just dead matter? Like, I don't understand what this is. And <clears throat> after the experiences in college, it was clear that there's something transcendent of reality that the mind can't, in our current uh, confirmation uh, of conditioned mind, can't touch. And so it just became a, an article of like a deep knowing that there's something there, but it never, it never became concrete in a way where I said, you know, um, this is something that I'm gonna come back to, or this is something that's gonna happen. It was just like, you know, I gotta get my shit together. What am I gonna do with my life? You know, it was like, those kind of things had had manifest, but there was a deep um, discomfort, like a deep dissatisfaction that started to stick and never left. That was just like, mm -hmm. okay, something's really wrong with, there's nothing that makes me happy for very long, and why is that? I'm always looking for the next thing. My friends called me a professional misanthrope. Like I was just constantly, doesn't matter what happened, I was just like, yeah, but you know what's gonna happen next? This shit's gonna hit the fan. And, and it was always <clears throat> that kind of thing. And I think d deep at the heart I knew, I was like, yeah, but there's something transcendent of all that. I don't know what it is, but I've, I've mm. touched into it. And in those moments where I felt it, it's like realer than anything. So. But but yeah, it, it didn't it didn't become concrete in that way where I was like, oh, this I'm coming back to this. Yeah, yeah, and just to point out to anyone watching this, um, you and I have pointed this out in our talks several times. I I pointed out frequently, and that is what you just described. You gave voice to that that just discomfort, angst, um, dysphoria, of being a being a human, and even though you're doing all the things you're supposed to do, you you, know, you come from a good family, you're in you're in med school, you're doing, and yet you know if you're honest with yourself, even if maybe you don't talk about it or you do talk about it, but you know something still is quite not right. That as uncomfortable as that is, and and that can be scary to even hear another person say that for the first time, because it reflects your your own experience that you might be hiding from yourself. But but to actually embrace that and see it as true as, as that you're actually feeling that way is really important and it's okay. It's not only okay, it's really the really the first step to to realization in my opinion because without that, you're really in la-la land. I, 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 only in retrospect can I agree with that, you know? I think at the time, if I felt like that, I would say my ego would reflect on itself and say, <clears throat> you're an ungrateful piece of crap. Like you have all That's the right. things, 
you're doing all the things like how can you say that this is not satisfaction people are starving in africa they're starving in india and you're sitting here saying you're not happy and and in a way what the friends were reflecting to me was that kind of vibe like bro like come on like you got to yeah. just get over yourself and and i think another thing you said is like <clears throat> so if you say something like you know this is just a it's dissatisfying to be a human in the mindset that we're in, a lot of people get very triggered and they go, well, you know, what do you, what do you mean, you know, by that? And, and then it becomes even more negative reflection to even allow yourself to feel that in an open and authentic way. And it becomes this kind of loop, mm -hmm. uh, kind of, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting too, because I, I know that the, the movement of a friend or a family member who in all uh, authenticity that they're mustering means it. They're like, oh, here, let me tell you how to think about it to get over that. They're, it's fascinating. That's just part of the delusion, though. It's part of the collective delusion because it's going here. No, no, don't, don't look at all that uncomfortable stuff down there, those repressed emotions. Just pretend you're not, they're not there. Pretend you're not repressing them. You shouldn't repress them because you're in a first world and you have money and you have blah, blah, blah right? It's like, so you shouldn't be suffering, so, so you're not. No, you're still <laughs> suffering, right? So, um, and, and and God love all our friends and family, but but my point is, I'll tell you the opposite. When people tell me that personally, they tell they come to me with that kind of dysphoria. I'm like, you know, my heart goes out to you. I want to hug you right now, but it's music to my ears. Yeah, you're in a really good place because you're being deeply authentic. Yeah, and you know, it's the first rule of Buddhism, right? Life is suffering. So. Um, doesn't mean everything in life is suffering. It doesn't mean there's no other way than suffering. But if you're really honest with yourself and and you're identified with you know mind and 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 the the social uh, the, the the massive social hypnosis of what it means to be a person and what what's important supposed to be important and not important, it's uncomfortable. You know. So anyway. and, and and there's no recourse in society really short of going going to a monastery in the old days, right? And it feels like there's no yeah. recourse. It's like, oh, I don't belong here. Okay, so <clears throat> all, all my life I felt like I don't belong here. I don't belong here. I don't belong here. So it manifests as, oh, okay, I'm gonna use humor. I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna go become a guitarist. I'll become a skateboarder. And then I'll go to medical school. I'll become a doctor. That'll fix it. That'll fix it. That'll fix it. And at each step, you get a little dopamine. You get a little relief maybe. But I think you said this in your book, it feels like you're driving with the brakes on. <laughs> You've got one foot on the gas, full full on, and the other foot fully on the brake, and the car just going, <laughs> and that's what it feels like. There's just heat and sparks coming off yeah. you, and you can't figure out what it yeah. is. Yeah. yeah. Tension, struggle, frustration, depression, anxiety, all of the stuff, you know. Um, okay, so now we're in the bonus round, Ooh. just for fun. Okay, we're going to do 10 questions. I just made this up, by the way, <laughs> about med school. That's the end of the um, bonus round. Thanks for playing. Uh, so let's maybe fast forward just a little bit, but um, fill in anything you think we might have skipped over. But, you know, you're an attending physician. You're, you're working um, at, at a teaching hospital. You're an internal medicine doc. You're working with residents and students and probably have some of your own patients and so forth. When did things start feeling to you like my career is going to take a pivot here or... Mm -hmm. When did maybe when did the sort of performance type stuff and and that start to take precedent in your in your career? Yeah, you know, so I probably started my formal career at Stanford as a hospitalist at age thirty. It was also the year I got married. Um, it was also <clears throat> it was quite a momentous change because it's you know, another decade of life and all that. And so I went in with very wide-eyed optimism and it was rewarded with actual reality. We had time to spend with our patients. We had a team of residents, medical students, sub-interns, the whole thing, case management, social work, physical therapy, occupational therapy, eh, all the specialists that you consult with. You felt like, you know, there's this thing in Hinduism, uh, Indra's net or Indra's jewels, where it's just everything is connected and in every jewel and every person you see reflected every other person. That's what it felt like doing, and I can only now kind of put it in that perspective, but it just felt so connected. And I love that. That's what I realized I was drawn to in hospital medicine was that, that, um, sense of interdependency and interconnection. Uh, it's like what, what you were saying earlier, you have this, this sort of, peer feedback that's kind of near real time and, and, and everything kind of pulses with this connection. 
And so it was great. And, and we, we had an electronic health record that was read only, not write. So we could write our notes and we could write that way, but we could get the information out of the chart that was all, you know, labs and all that. That was great. So what computers were good at, they were good at. And then we could do the easy stuff, which was just writing with our hand. There's something about writing with our hand too that allowed a connection between the physical motor aspect of communication and language and the patient's story that allowed a kind of a synthesis that was different. So it was really wonderful. And I, I, at that time, I was, it was the first time in my life that um, I wasn't constantly in school. Like it was the end of school. So here I am in, in the world. And so I'm able to express myself in a different way with a kind of confidence and an independence. And I was teaching, which I loved. And, and so it was beautiful, actually. Uh, it was one of the best times actually uh, in my life to that point. And I, would, I started taking a little journal where I was like, oh, you know, maybe I'll start writing this down. You know, it was weird, Angela, I just realized this. The reason I started take, keeping a journal was not to process things or to find a deeper meaning in them or any of that. It was to solidify and make permanent something that I instinctually knew was ephemeral. <laughs> like this degree of well-being is not long for this earth and I need to write it down as a way of capturing it. It's almost like going on vacation and doing nothing but taking pictures. You're just trying to, to solidify this thing. And, and it just now became clear that that's what I was doing. And because it was so wonderful, I was like, this is too good to be true. And it was because what would end up happening then is about, I think about four or five years into it, uh, they started, you know, Epic went live as a input output. I'm taking my work home. I had a kid in uh, uh, when I was 30, how old was I? 35 and 33 maybe. Yeah, uh, something like that. I don't remember now. Uh, it would have been 20, it doesn't matter. I, I was a few years into it and I had my first child and that sort of shifted everything because now there's this mix of priorities and the electronic health record means I'm working from home during pajama time. They're pulling back resident support because of work hour rules. Um, there's metrics now, like you need this many things. You have to click these boxes for quality measures or an administrator is gonna yell at you. Uh, higher volumes. Our corporation that we were in went from a partnership with doctors where we were all partners to a corporation. Now we're shareholders. And that change, it felt more like a, a, I felt more like a commodity. Everything that I call health 2.0 started coming online. And so that's when I realized I was like, I could see the writing on the wall. Like I can't do this. Like this is everything when I was young, being oppositional and all that started to fire up again and was like, this is not my life. I'm living someone else's life. <laughs> I can't do this. And, 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 but I didn't know what to do. Like, what are you going to do? You spent so much money and time and blood and sweat and all that residency and training. And it's not like now I can just go work in, you know, industry or something. I, like I'm a hospitalist. I don't have that specialized skill set to go, you know, be a pharma consultant. And I wouldn't do that anyways, because it felt dirty and wrong. And, and so for me, and so I was really stuck. And that's when I started getting depressed again. I was like, this is not me. There's a sense of disconnection from the authenticity of of who you were, which wasn't there early in my career. I was like, no, this is me. This is great. I get to mm. teach. I was winning teaching awards, like all this stuff. And then I stopped winning teaching awards because I stopped caring about medicine. I really did. It became a point where I was like, if I care about this, I'm going to get hurt because I know I can't do it the way it needs to be done. And so mm. how can I put all my energy and love into this when I'm just going to, I'm, it's going to be, it's going to stab me right in the chest. So uh, it became very difficult. Mm. So in in that noticing of the of the trends changing, not having the resources and the structure that that worked well for you and for your team and so forth, did you kind of uh, go down the path of trying to actually do something about that directly, like at, you know fight it, ask for resources, et cetera, or were you more like like I generally feel when when things massive things change in medicine and you go, this is bigger than anything I'm going to fix. It's just how it is, and you kind of accept it and try to try to go along and adjust. Yeah, great man. So the way it was for us was we were a group and there were a bunch of hospitalists in the group, and the way we would fight back is we would claw and scrape for hours. We'd be like, okay. Mm -hmm. If we can just get another hospital, if we can convince the corporate overlords to hire another person, it'll change our schedule in a way that makes it more sustainable. Oh, they're getting rid of residents? Okay, then I want a PA or I want this. And so trying to kind of band-aid the change, which made which was turning medicine from a relationship into a transaction, trying to band-aid that with just throwing resources at, 
at, at it as a, as a quick fix. That's what we did. So we were just trying to make it sustainable so that we could get through the day. But nobody was like, oh, we're going to transform medicine. That was not even close to the agenda because we knew it was like what you said. This is well beyond us. You know, everything was going on, Affordable Care Act, everything was changing um, uh, medicine. And, and so we said, OK, there's really nothing. It, it just was nothing we could do. And we weren't at the yeah. corporate level, so we, we didn't even have control of the business of medicine. It was, we were the ones being controlled by it. Yeah, yeah, it's like it's, a, it's like a Leviathan and there's so many moving parts and it's not like one person in the middle of it that's at fault or something. It's just, it's got so much momentum already. And uh, anyway, so as you're going through this and you're, you're starting to feel this, this, I guess, as you meant depression, as you mentioned or described depression or just, really disillusionment with the, with the job now and how it is and how it's playing out. Are you performing at this point? Are you starting to to do videos and, and that kind of thing? Are you thinking about it or where are you at with that? So it's funny. So my escape mechanism, I had a couple escape mechanisms to escape from this, you know, self-imposed hell of <laughs> what I felt was like, it, it, I was like, wait, there's no longer, because another thing changes, Angelo, there's no longer a progression. There's no longer a spot in the future where you can project and go, oh, once this happens, will be okay. Uh, if I just become a resident, it'll be better. Okay, once I'm done with residency, it'll be better, I'll be an attending. Okay, I'm an attending, but what's next? You work your way up the hierarchy and, oh, am I gonna be an administrator now? No way, I don't wanna do that. So there's nothing else. So so I started like tinkering around with like audio gear at home, like trying to find hobbies to distract. And those were mm -hmm. just neurosis. It was just like, oh, I'll change this cable for this cable. Oh, there's a little more treble uh, brightness there. Oh, and I'll do, like that kind of neurosis. And so it just, um, there, there was nothing. And now I even forget what you even asked me because I was remembering the hell of like audio gear. Uh, what well, was the question yeah, again? I was curious how the, the performance stuff played into this or were you getting into performance yet? And that's stuff? right, that's right. So what would happen is people realized, you know, they saw my old um, uh, med school graduation speech because my buddy had taped it on VHS and I had digitized it and put it on my computer. And there was this thing called YouTube that was happening in like 20, 2006. And I'm like, what would happen if I just put this up on YouTube? It'd be kind of funny. And I did, and it got like 50,000 views or something crazy, which back then was like super viral. And so I was like, whoa. And so my colleagues watched that video and they were like, dude, you actually used to be funny. Like what, what happened to you? Like, why don't you do some stand up for our, you know, our staff meeting or whatever? And so I was like, yeah, why not? You know, I was scared, <laughs> terrified, but I'm like, sure. So I wrote some really dumb jokes about what it's like to be us. And I would go up and, at these staff meetings and I do like a 30 minute set of just straight up stand up. And I had things like the empathy robot, like the robot that you hire that's built so that it cares so you don't have to. And, it, and you would just type in the ICD-9 of the, ro of the <laughs> patient's disease in the back and it would go in the room and be like, Mr. Williams, it must be very difficult suffering from arthropathy, not otherwise specified. You know? <laughs> and it would have full facial like animatronics, like it would show like empathy. So it was stuff like that. And people were resonating with it. And I'm like, oh, this is weird. Like this is like kind of using my, my young weird owl in the current situation to kind of relieve kind of what, what I later would realize was communalization of pain. Like we're all suffering but we feel isolated. We feel like we're just the only one who can't hack it. And we complain to each other, but that's not the same. Like communalizing pain is saying, here's what our pain looks like, right? Isn't that funny? Like, can we all agree that this sucks? Yeah, okay, well now I feel a little better. Cause it's not just me, I'm not defective. It's all this that's <laughs> defective. So that's yeah. what I would do to kind of blow off steam a little bit early on there. I guess what I, what I was wondering as you were describing that, first of all, the robot, empathy robot's awesome. Um, but what I was wondering as you're describing this is when you started doing the the comedy again, or when you started doing this, this like formalized almost stand up comedy for your group and, and peers, did it have a different quality before you mentioned some of the, you know, um, the, the comedy or the being funny was a bit of a defense mechanism or whatever at this stage of things, was it more, uh, like creative feeling? Yeah, it felt, um, really good. Like, you know, I would get on like a exercise machine at the gym and I would empty my mind and these ideas would just come up and I'd jot them down really fast on my Palm Pilot because I had that in those days. And uh, it would just become this act of, 
authentic creation that that was informed by everything that we were all going through. And I actually, I realized I've been doing some of those since since uh, residency. Actually, I would do occasional stand up for you know a, you know American College of Physicians meetings and things like that with just small groups and things like that. And it it really gave me a sense of again, oh, this is more authentic to who I am. I'm a doctor, but I'm also this guy that finds the humor in these things and trying to point points them out because these are real problematic aspects of medicine and I'm powerless to change them, it feels like. So maybe if I can, at least we can, I do have power to make people laugh about them and go, hey, that is a problem. Maybe some magic will happen and the problem will get better or at least we'll be yeah. able to get through it because we'll see the humor in it. So it was kind of like that. Hmm. And then it just started picking up or you, you started getting more views, more, did you, when did you start getting invited for like paid, paid things? And yeah, it, it, some people heard through Grapevine, and so I'd get an occasional very small paid gig, like a couple hundred bucks, and I'd do that, but it still wasn't a big deal. And because I wasn't on YouTube except for that one video, uh, mm. that was it. And, uh, and that's when, you know, that's when, and, and I was pretty miserable still, like increasingly miserable. And that's when, like, the kind of big pivot happened, uh, where <laughs> it was kind of like a, you know, I don't even know how to describe it, but, but, that's where this guy, Tony Shea, kind of came into the picture and, mm. and things went off the rails. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah. So I was, I was hoping we were getting to that. I couldn't remember the time frame of this. Yeah. So you met, you met this, this guy through, through your wife, right? This um, wealthy man. And he had, some, he had some ideas for you, right? Or, well, let me ask you this. When did the event happen in the closet? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> With the, yeah. Is that later on? That's a little later, but it's all related. Yeah, it's all related okay. to Tony. So the, the long story short is this. Tony Shea was a guy who went to school with my wife at college, and he sold his first company to Microsoft in his 20s for $250 million. He was that kid from the Bay Area, nerdy Asian kid, somewhere on the Asperger spectrum, who just knew he had an intuition about people. He had an intuition about what people needed. And he built a company called Link Exchange that he sold to Microsoft, had all this money. And that's when I met him, when I met my wife in residency as interns at Stanford. We were both in medicine residency at that time. And she goes, oh, you should meet my friend, Tony. He's like this multimillionaire. He sold this thing. And I'm like, oh, great. You know, just another guy to remind me of what a total loser I am being in medicine, right? <laughs> this is like 1999 when I met him. And I met him and I'm like, this is a quirky, introverted dude who's like, he, there's something there, like something really transcendent, but you would meet him and just be like, that was awkward, you know? Cause he just had that just weird way about him. It's hard to describe. It's very Tony. That's how we would say it later. And, but he's just a brilliant guy. So fast forward years later, he, he, he grows his second company Zappos to a $1.2 billion sale uh, to Amazon. So he merges with Amazon and Amazon said, Hey, stay on as the CEO. You'll be fully independent and you can do what you like. And his whole thing was building a culture of connectedness, mm. turning selling shoes from a transaction into a relationship where they would have a call center and they would elevate the call center employees to like, these are the heroes of the corp, right? They were the ones who would spend three hours on the phone with someone, understanding their hopes, dreams, and fears. And in the end, they'd buy a pair of shoes and they'd be fiercely loyal. They had 365 day returns and all this. He, he turned something that was impossibly reductionistic, selling shoes online into this beautiful, holistic kind of enterprise. And so always voted the best place to work in Forbes magazine was Zappos, amazing culture. So he sells it in 2008, $1.2 billion. Now he's a billionaire and he calls, he emails me and my wife and he's like, come and visit me for Thanksgiving. I'm having a party and you guys should come. And, and so he, we went and saw him and he'd just written a book called Delivering Happiness, which was about his thing with Zappos and how it's really about you know, well-being. And he based it on Jonathan Haidt's work and others around happiness. And, and it was this great book and it became a bestseller and all of this in business circles. So we're sitting there at dinner and he's like, you know, he's just got this great place and all these people around him and his family's there. And I'm like, this guy's happy. Like, you can just tell he's just beaming well-being. Um, but he's still Tony, he's still who he is. And he asked me, so are you happy doing what you're doing? You know, this is great. You're a Stanford doc. And Tony's parents were like, wow, you know, we wish Tony had gone into medicine, you know, like this kind of thing, right? Like, cause this is like Asian parents. And uh, I'm like, yeah, yeah. You know, I've got a 401k and I got an Acura. I, mean, I got moonroof and, you know, it's, no, <laughs> no, I'm not happy. <laughs> Who am I trying to lie to? Like, I, it's miserable. 
It sucks. You know what medicine is like? And I told him all the things. And he said, so what what would you do if you could do anything? And I'm like, well, I, you know, I put my med school graduation on YouTube and it got some views and he watched it. And he's like, he's like, that shit is funny. He's like, you, you should do that. Just put stuff on YouTube. Like it's a thing now, like 2008. I go and do it. I have all my, so he knew all the famous YouTubers at the time. And he's like, oh, this guy does it this way. And this guy does it this way. And I'm like, this is too much. Like, I can't do this. I'm at Stanford. I'll get, I'll I'll get fired. Like I can, he's like, just make up a character, like whatever. I'm like, oh, you mean like Z Dog MD? Like, like I'm Snoop Dogg or something. And like, I'll do like funny raps, keep people from coming in the hospital. He's like, yeah, like that. Just do it like that. And I was like, I was kidding, dude. (laughs) And, uh, and then it was funny. So that we went back home. And it triggered in me, and he said, read The Happiness Hypothesis by Jonathan Haidt about how the mind is divided into unconscious and conscious and hopes and dreams and fears, and then this little rationalizer and all this. And it's a long story, but I was like, oh, so you can actually motivate people by connecting with heart, and then you gently direct the thinker, and they'll change behavior. And I got so depressed. Like when I got home, I'm like, dude, he's right. And I'm too much of a wuss to actually do this. Like, how am I going to do this? There's no way. I don't even have a cam. Like, I had an old PC. I don't even know how to do any of this stuff. And I'm busy. I'm full-time hospitalist. So I got super depressed. Like, the most depressed I've ever been in my life was this three-month period after this visit to delivering happiness. And uh, I was pissed. And my wife was like, dude, there's something really wrong with you. Like, um, because she'd gone back to retrain in radiology because she saw that was her calling, right? Medicine was something she did for her parents. And then she comes back and she's like, no, this is what I really want to do. And, and so she's like, listen, um, just, just listen to Tony and do what he, do what he's saying. And, and, you know, what could go wrong? You get fired. You probably secretly want to get fired. Like just go and do it. And so I did. So I started making videos and the first one was colon wars about, <laughs> about what we were talking about earlier about doing GI and going in the colon and, and, uh, and they started getting traction. And the, the ones that I found got the most traction weren't the ones aimed at patients. They were the ones aimed at healthcare professionals, communalizing mm-hmm. our pain. The, the comedic aspects of music, using music parody to make fun of, like one of our early hits was a song called Call Day, which was Rebecca Black's Friday, which was about, uh, it's call day, call day, gonna get kicked in the balls day. You know, it was like all this garbage and it goes kind of viral and all these docs and residents and med students. And I was like, oh, that's a thing. Like, again, showing that we have this particular pain points and then laughing at it and saying, hey, I don't have solutions, but I can say what the problem is. And a problem well-defined is half solved already. So it started picking up after that. Mm, That's really cool. When did Doc Vader uh, come online? Years later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Years later when I'd already moved to Vegas, but the, the, the interim thing that had happened was it started growing in over two years. I started in 2010. By 2012, that's when Tony came back and was like, okay, now you're doing your thing. Like, so here's a proposal. Like, quit your job at Stanford. Have your wife quit her job as a radiologist at Stanford. You have two young girls now. Move from the Bay Area where you own a house and all this. And you've like gotten in before it got incredibly expensive. And move to the Bay, do, move to Las Vegas where we are. And I'm investing in downtown Las Vegas to catalyze the emergence of what I did with Zappos, but at a community level in a downtown place where we want community, we want connections, we want this kind of awakening to happen in Vegas. He didn't use that term, but that's what he was kind of implying. And I didn't know any, I was like, what is even going on? I've never done anything but medicine really. Like I, I have no idea what's going on. And I told him, no, I was like, I can't do this. Like there's no way I could quit this job because what am I, how am I even gonna get paid? And he's like, oh, you know, I'll invest in, some startup that you do that accomplishes these things. And it was my wife actually who said, you should listen to Tony. I will take a hit for the team. I'll quit. We'll go there and you can try to actualize whatever it is you're supposed to actualize with yourself. Um, And I'll do teleradiology just to keep my feet in it. And we trust Tony. Like we know he's a good person. We know he's not trying to hurt us or anything. And you know, it'll be on us to make it work. And if it doesn't work, we'll come back. We'll rent our place out. We'll come back. I'll take my job back at Stanford and we'll be okay. Right. So I was like, I don't know that that doesn't feel okay to me. That feels terrifying to me. (laughs) So, but that was when I actually listened to my wife and I listened to what intuition was saying, which is let's do this. And we did. And it was the biggest disruption in my life that could ever have happened. Like it was just uproot this Mm -hmm. and everything you thought you were is gone. And now you're in living in a high rise in downtown Las Vegas in a effectively a demilitarized zone that hasn't been built yet. Uh, because Tony hadn't invested yet and you don't even know what you're going to do with yourself. And that was the first big transition point. 
Man. <laughs> and so how did you, once you moved, and from what I remember you telling me, you literally physically moved before you actually knew what you were going to do, right? Absolutely. Because we said, Tony, yeah. and you know, the thing is you're grasping for stability. Like that's my personality type. That's a lot of us go into medicine because it's a stable thing. And you're saying, okay, mm -hmm. do I have a 401k? Do I have a salary? Do I have the, what, what, what are we doing? What are we doing, Tony? What are we doing? What are we doing? He's like, I, I don't know what you're doing. Like, that's the whole point. I'm bringing people here from all different fields to try to create a vibrant downtown. And I'm just investing seed money so that they can roll with it. And either they make it work or they don't, right? But here's your chance to do what you've always dreamed of doing. It's like a dream incubator. And we're using the city as the incubator. And I was like, I didn't understand a word you just said. <laughs> like, I, I don't even know what you're talking about. Like dream incubator, like, it doesn't mean anything to me um, because I was so conditioned, right? And um, imagine, you know, the Indian parents were like, you're doing what? So I had to pretty much lie to my parents and say, oh, no, 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 I have a salary and he's gonna, you know, we're building a, we're building a hospital. That's what we're doing. We're building a hospital and I'm gonna run the hospital. That was, I had no idea what we were doing, right? So, wow. um, so it, was, it was just show up and he said, take the next six months and just meet people, connect with everyone. I'm gonna introduce you to all these different people and brainstorm what you think would be a way to generate community and connection in medicine and transform medicine, not just for downtown Vegas, but in a broader sense. And I was like, so in those six months is where everything kind of shifted and got disrupted. And <laughs> I was like, oh, oh yeah. So it, it, uh, yeah. it got interesting. So before we get to that part briefly, um, so now he said, okay, I'm going to network you in this, in this incubation, you know, cauldron of the unknown apparently. Uh, but so were you meeting influencers and entrepreneurs and what, how did you find, how was that? Was it enjoyable to, to network in that way? Was it still just terrifying? Like, I don't know what the heck I'm doing or how did that start to feel to you? Yeah, all those things were true. So because of Tony, you had the key to the city. So you could meet mm -hmm. with anybody in Las Vegas and people were coming through all the time to see what he was doing. So you would meet like, you know, Ashton Kutcher would be standing around, you know, and you'd be like Zoltan. And he would go Zoltan from dude, where's my car? And, and just crazy stuff. And you're just going, I don't belong here at all. Like what's even happening. But the cool thing was there were a lot of people who acted as, you know, if you look at like, it's funny, you had pointed me to Joseph Campbell's hero's journey and listening to the Bill Moyer special with Joseph Campbell, the power of myth. It is the classic hero's journey. The, 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 the person, and we're all on a hero's journey. It doesn't mean you have to be a hero, right? It's everybody. There's a hero in his old world and you cross the threshold into the unknown. And in the process, there's a mentor, and often that mentor is supernatural. That was Tony. But along the way, there are lots of helpers. So the helpers were, every single person I met was giving me a different angle on healthcare or a different angle on culture, a different angle on community. And they would teach me things that to this day inform how I think about transforming healthcare or doing social media or psychology or spirituality or whatever it is. And, um, and that was a gift. Like, that I would have refused, that I tried to refuse. And the call to adventure is often refused by somebody who's bound by fear or by duty or by inertia, whatever it is. And, and it's just by the grace of whatever, usually the people around you, that you overcome that. Um, mm. So that's what it was like. And it was just, it was mind expanding. Like, I, I, I never felt so, and, and, and the desert is like that too, because the desert's a blank slate. You're coming from something that's been built to something that's open and vast. Mm. And you're just like, it's all potential. Like I could do anything. And it, that's disorienting. It was disorienting for my wife because now she's taken out of her world of teaching residents where she was winning teaching awards all the time and feeling deeply connected and all that to being working at night with a little thing on calling ERs on the East Coast, reading their films. And she felt really disconnected. Whereas I was finally in, in my element. I'm like, oh my God, I'm reconnected to this possibility. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was, it was a real cool. interesting kind of challenging time. <laughs> That's super cool. So speaking of uh, catalytic mentors that operate in the, the sort of magical spectrum, was there another person around at this time that was friends with Tony that you got introduced to? Yeah. So Tony, and this is something that, again, like I only really realized what happened in retrospect. Um, but even at the time, it was remarkable. So there was a, a woman that was friends with Tony who was also coming downtown to start a like a pop-up retail store around fashion. And she was a um, fashion designer at the highest levels, like with or fashion consultant with Marc Jacob and these big fashion houses in LA and was in the kind of jet set lifestyle and all that. Very ego-driven, all of that. 
and kind of woke up, was like, this is empty, it's miserable, and started doing Bikram yoga and this like very intense yoga and just had these shifts and was known in local circles as the sorceress. That's what we'll call her. So she was called the sorceress because she would hang out with people and they would come away different. Uh, <laughs> and no one would figure out what was going on. And I heard this and I was like, yeah, no, no, she's really cool, whatever. And Tony was like, you, this was Tony's gift. He would connect people. And then he would stand back and watch the fun. And so he's like, you should meet the sorceress because I know he's looking at my clothes that I'm wearing. And he's like, you dress like you shop at Mervyn's. I'm like, I do shop at Mervyn's. <laughs> like that's, <laughs> I don't know anything about clothes. Like, I, you know, how I dress at the hospital is basically scrubs and outside I'm just wearing shorts and a t-shirt. And he's like, you're going to be meeting with people. You're going to be doing all this stuff. Like Tony would just wear a t-shirt and jeans, but Tony could do it because he was a billionaire. He's like, I could tell you're uncomfortable in some of these things where you feel like kind of awkward and that inner nerd in you is coming out. Sarah can help you. She'll take you to, to the stores and can help you dress. Like you're getting a million dollar fashion consultant for, for free. Like you should meet her. And I'm like, cool. So I meet her. She meets me and my wife. We hang out. We have dinner. We're getting to know each other. She's awesome. She's funny. I was like, dude, this woman is amazing. So one night, Tony invites me up to his place because we all lived in the same building. He lived higher up. So we, I go up there and, and the sorceress is there with Tony. And she's like, hey, we're smoking some weed. You want to hang out? And I'm like, oh, this is like the college dorms all over again. Great. It's been a long time since I've done this. So sure. So I don't know what they're putting in the weed these days. I mean, it is like 100% THC now. So I take one hit of this pipe and I'm in the fourth dimension again. Like I'm curled up in the closet and we were in the, in Tony's closet, which is a big closet. So Tony's there, she's the sorceress is there and I'm there. And I am suddenly just like in the bubble, you know, that bubble, <laughs> like, oh my God, I am so high. Uh, I can't even think clearly. And the minute I start to feel the effects of this, she starts to lock eyes with me and she's like, okay, so Zubin, like, um, have you ever noticed that when you're in a group of more than two people or more than one person, you just start making jokes right away. And Tony's there, right? And he's like, yeah, I've noticed that. Like, you, you're always making jokes. Like, I think it's really funny, but it's interesting. Like, can you even go 30 seconds without making a joke when there's more than one person in the room? And, you know, I'm sitting here going, okay, there's a billionaire and this creepy sorceress, like, and I'm in a closet and I'm so high. I'm so high right now. Like, and they're attacking me. Remember earlier I said there's this egoic reflection where the ego is looking at itself and it's like, you're a piece of shit. Like, you don't even need to be here. You quit your job, dude, at Stanford. You were a Stanford doctor. Like your parents were telling people in India, he's a Stanford doctor. And now you're in a closet. You're high as fudge with, with, with this chick and this billionaire. And I started having these paranoid thoughts. I'm like, maybe he brought me here to like, just as a joke, like rich people have this joke where they take somebody who, who had a job and they mess with them. It's like dinner with schmucks or something. Like th this is just a mess. And, um, like a one dollar bet with another billionaire that he can take a professional who makes a really good salary and has a good family and uproot him to another city. Absolutely, it was like get him into a closet and then tell him <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> it was like a reverse My Fair Lady. Like I'll turn this professional <laughs> into a real steaming piece of shit by the end of this. Like no problem. And he bets he bets Bezos, right? <laughs> so, so it, it, I felt like that. I was like, this is terrible. And and they keep going. They're like, you know, and here you have this wonderful family. And like, you're, you're, you know, you're here in the closet. Like, you know, I know Margaret's having trouble, like with the transition, like, have you paid attention to her? Like, you're worried about what you're going to dress in and you know, you're, you're not. And so this is the other thing is like, so the way Sarah got to know me prior to the Sarah, I just said her name, the sorceress, Sarah, she, um, got to know me by taking me and my wife shopping for clothes and by understanding what my preferences were and what I thought I was, and she would say, now, is that really you? Or is that who you think you are? Like, what really, what, what, what was really you? Here's some choices, what do you think? And she would really get to know you in the dressing room and, and when we have dinner and all that. And that's what she does, it turns out, is she takes people shopping and she gets up and knows what their sort of egoic fixations are and all of this. And I didn't know any of this at the time. So I'm sitting there and I'm like, uh, uh, how do you, uh, uh, she's like, you know, and you and Margaret, and this is what I noticed about your relationship is this and that. And I'm like, what the hell is going on? And I'm feeling absolutely like my ego is flaming hot right now. Like it's just attacked directly and all the defenses are fired up, but I'm stoned as fuck. I'm so high 
that I can't even, I, 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 I'm almost disarmed in that way because I'm unable to string a cohesive sense, sense together. And I'm so in the present moment, there's nothing else. And it's doing that time framing thing too, where I'm unable to string things together. So every moment is a fresh moment where I'm, 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 I'm encountering reality fresh again. And, uh, and again, it's kind of, I haven't really put myself in that mindset in many years, but, and, and then I'm in the closet. And the next thing I know, we're not in the closet, we're in the kitchen. And there's been a, sh there's a shift in the energy of it. Now she's saying, but here's what I see. You know, you're afraid to do public speaking because we've talked to you about like going, giving talks about medicine and this and this, and you're afraid to do it and this and this and this, but this is what I see. I see a guy who's who's funny, who's smart, who lo loves to teach, who's connected, who loves his family and feels deep duty to them, is conflicted. And you could go out and actualize who you are if you choose to let go of who you think you are. And here's another thing. And I'm just sitting here at the kitchen, just like, like I'm speechless at this point. I can't even speak. Like I'm, I'm you know, I, I might've been crying. I don't even know what was going on. But, but she says, you gotta understand this. There's nothing that exists in the past or the future. That's not a thing. There's only this moment. And she says, I woke up to that, that there's just this, this present moment. That's, she says, that's why she likes to smoke weed because it brings her right into this. And she goes, feel it right now. Is there anything outside of this? And I'm like, no, ma'am, <laughs> like there's just this. And at this point I'm white knuckled on the counter basically. And she said, she kept going. And at this point, I don't remember what happened. Uh, but I remember, I just remember leaving the room feeling like I did not have problems. Like there was no problem at all because what I thought I was, was not like, what even was that? That's not even a thing. There's just this and I can do anything in just this. And I was like, I'm gonna go to bed. I went to bed. And I went to bed, I remember this thinking, I'm gonna forget all of this, this is all a dream. Like everything that just happened was just me really high and whatever. And I woke up in the morning and I was like, I remember everything. <laughs> it's all like just floating on cloud nine of just pure, everything was just perfect. There was no problem. And I told my wife and I was like, Sarah, like this is what happened. And she's like, what? And I'm like, yeah. Th I, I, I can't tell you what happened. I don't even know, but I am, I've am i never been this sure that we're doing the right thing and that everything is perfect. Like there's no, there's nothing to worry about at all. <laughs> yeah, and then it kind of went from there. Yeah, it, it, did it feel like a, a, a sort of heavy weight that you really didn't even know you were carrying was just suddenly not even there? Every problem that I thought was a real problem was just suddenly not there. And, and it was seen to have been just... Like it was never a problem. Like well, how, how could I think that? It was all just a projection. It was all like kind of a dream. That's what it felt like. But I had no, yeah. but see, Angela, I had no container for any of this. I didn't know, I'm a hardcore atheist. I'm a science-based guy. A lot of my videos were like making fun of people who talk about like energy and all this garbage. And I was like, this is it's not a thing. Like, I don't even know what that is. And here I am feeling like, I don't know what this is, but there was never that egoic striving. That was something that became clear that night. She's like, that's all your ego. That's all who you think you are. That's all the story that you're telling yourself. What you are is like, here's what I see. Is that even compatible with what you see? And then that just tells you like, this is all a dream. <laughs> so, mm. and uh, so I, I, I didn't even know, but it was this huge sense of relief and everything looked new, like through the eyes of like, like a child. Like I was like, oh, this is, like, look at this building, look at my kids, look at my wife, you know, crying, talking to my wife. She's like, you've never cried in front of me. <laughs> like, what's even going on? <laughs> and I tell you, I, I, I have never from that moment been the same. And even then I knew I'm like, oh, I'm not the same person. Like, I don't even know who I am now. Like, but, but mm -hmm. something snapped and I didn't know. I had no, I st still don't really know what it is. It's it, the whole yeah. thing is shrouded in this kind of mystery. I, I don't know what it is. Yeah. So anyone listening, you, you just described what I would call Ken show or awakening, <laughs> an awakening uh, a shift. It's not an experience. It's and it's not something that happens to you. It's the you that you think you are suddenly just bleeding out or dissolving into something completely different, more vast, more free, more um, 
very paradoxical. As you said, you still don't know what it is. You still can't know what it is. I would agree with that. I can't know what this is. I can't know what I am. But that, that the question doesn't even arise. It doesn't matter. There's a there's an absolute certainty in the uncertainty. There's there's a there's a complete solidity in the emptiness. It's it's so impossible to talk about. Um, but but I love this story because it's just such a great example of how you never fucking know how this is going to play out. You just don't know. It can come out of nowhere. You don't have to have a spiritual context. You don't have to even have experience, um, knowledge about Buddhism or Hinduism or anything. It's amazing. Uh, and it worked. You know, something, some, some set of conditions lined themselves up and it just made this happen, you know? Super I, cool. I, 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 and I tell you, like, so much gratitude wells up when that happens. You're just like, thank you, Tony. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, existence. Like, thank you, thank you. And I, I had no idea. I had no idea what it was. And I still don't know. Like, I still, if you tell me, oh, that was Awakening or Ken Show, I'll be like, I, all I know is I was completely uh, different. And and you know what was interesting is recently, because I knew you were going to interview me about this, I texted Sarah. And we haven't talked and spoken in years because we all kind of split up after Vegas. And uh, I said, do you remember anything about that night? And she goes, oh, I remember everything. I remember you crying. I remember you, you know, this and this and this. And I said, well, what is it that you did? And she said, I do what I always do. I held up a mirror to what you are. And she said, she said, sometimes people hate me because I hold up that mirror. And sometimes people love me because I hold up that mirror. You were one of the people who ended up loving me because what you saw was reality. And, uh, and I was like, holy shit, you never told me that, <laughs> you know, like, and, and that's, that's really what it felt like is like seeing so yeah. clearly. And then the, just this kind of indescribable shift that you don't even know what it is, but afterwards, you know, that you don't even recognize the person you were before, um, mm. because those problems are, it's totally different. Now that's not to say, so, so what ended up happening after that is this runaway, like, oh, everything is different. I, st I suddenly someone, all these weird synchronicities start happening where a reporter for the Las Vegas Review Journal comes up to me, he's interviewing me about what we're gonna do building this clinic. And he says, oh, you know, I go, you know, I don't know what it is, man, but recently I've been introduced to this thing called the present moment. And so sometimes I'll just sit silently and there's this, this deep stillness. And, and he said, oh, you should listen to the audiobook The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle, because that happened mm -hmm. to me and I listened to the book. And after the first chapter, if you're not hooked, then you can just throw it away. And I was like, what? So I went home, got the book, listened to it. And I was like, and when Eckhart describes his awakening, I, 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 I was, it was like that. And it just ran away. And then I discovered Sam Harris's waking up. And then I discovered meditation for the first time. And then it all went from there. Mm. Yeah. And, and again, geared towards anyone listening to this, there's, there's something so fascinating and paradoxical about awakening it, itself, about the, the event that's not an event. Uh, it's so paradoxical. And, and here's one example. It's very common for people to contact me who are working at awakening. They're working at inquiry and these sorts of practices that you can sort of orient yourself toward awakening with. And it's so interesting because this question of certainty comes up all the time. It's like there's there's so much doubt in the questions I get asked in a sense. I mean, these are authentic and sincere people and they'll wake up. But there but until that shift, it's like there's so much doubt. And at the same time there's this weird arrogance of the mind that thinks it knows what awakening is. But when you've had a when you've had an awakening, you know, stream entry by Buddhist definition would be, you know, breaking the first fetter, which is the, the illusion of a separate self, basically. When that happens, it's not like you may or may not even know to call it an awakening. You damn well know something happened, but it's nothing like you thought it was. Nothing like you thought it could would have been. It doesn't have a sort of spiritual flavor in the way the mind thinks about spirituality because it doesn't have any flavor. It's too free to have flavors. Uh, and, and also, there's a the way the ego might expect things to play out after awakening is like, oh, I, I have this thing called awakening. You know, it's like, oh, it's cool. And I got, I got it. It's something I got and it made me better. It's just the opposite though. And that's why it's really strange. It's, it's a, it's a very sincere humbleness where you go, I don't know if that was an awakening. And I would have said that for many years myself. <clears throat> now I only speak about it in those terms. <clears throat> Excuse me. I speak about it in those terms because it works for teaching people. It works for pointing to it and so forth. But if I'm honest, I don't know if anything's ever happened. In fact, I'm, I'm quite sure nothing has ever happened. There's just this like 
this complete mystery at the heart of everything, but there's such an incredible certainty in it too. But the certainty isn't anything of the mind. It's nothing about the way things are, the way I am, what I need, what life is doing, what God is, like, it's none of that stuff. Those are all the mind grasping. It's just this, this incredible certainty and in just the, the okayness and the peace. And, and so, yeah, if you're listening to this and you go, how can someone go through that and, and, and not even know they had an awakening or not know what to call it that or whatever. I'll tell you, it's interesting. Right after it happens, right after awakening happens, uh, as someone's going through it, I'll, I'll often interact with them or interview them. And they know they don't care what it's called at that point. They, but they're so clear on, on, on this, this truth that we're talking about. But often years later, especially if you had no context for it and you weren't Buddhist and you didn't even know what it was, often you don't really look back on it as anything that you might even characterize as awakening because, again, from the conventional perspective, awakening sounds like a, a, a big good cookie you get that makes you feel better or makes you exalted in some way, and that just does not resonate that way. It's just, you just damn well know something changed, something left, something left in a way, right? Something, it just wasn't there. It just fell off and it's never been there since. Um, and, and so it's reasonably typical to have that. I've had interactions with people just like you, where after I had talked to you for, I don't know, a few months, I kind of, you told me about this and I'm like, dude, that's, that's an awakening. You know, it's just what it was. Um, <clears throat> and, and so it's not uncommon for people to have had it in the past and not quite realize what it was uh, largely because the way you find yourself now, like, how do you even find someone to orient, to identify that as something that happened to them? That doesn't, that kind of way of experiencing is kind of going away or gone. So it doesn't make sense to, to claim anything really. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to clarify that, that it's a very paradoxical thing, the way we're talking about this, but for me, it's, it's clear and it's obvious, but a lot of it's through experience and, and just having a lot of contact with this, this I, movement. You know, and, and something that, because again, when I first met you, Angela, I was like, I want to wake up. 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 I want, I want, I want, I want, I want, but I knew, but like this thing had happened and, and <laughs> it, you know, it's so strange. I can, you know. Ever since then, I can sit and touch into this indescribable sense of being that is all pervasive. It's always here. It's a silence that also accommodates everything, and and it's there. And uh, but but what happened even after the 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 thing is that the mind comes back with the doubt that exists in thought and starts spinning stories about oh you were just really high. Oh, you just, you know, you're the same person. Nothing's really different. Oh, you know, you still get so angry and you still feel like a separate self more often than you don't. And even though you can touch into that, like you're fast asleep. And increasingly now it feels more like my mind's telling me, yeah, don't stop. You're not done. There's so much, there, there, it's just the tip of this. And y there's so much more unfolding that you haven't realized. And no matter how your spiritual ego wants to think it knows, it doesn't know anything. <laughs> Actually, that's the intuition. Yeah. That's the intuition. Mm -hmm. And the yeah. mind grabs that intuition. It's like, you're fast asleep. You don't even know what's up. You have no hope. Yeah. Yeah. And in the book, this is, this is what I describe as you've taken the VR goggles off. You've gotten out of the, the, the box, right? You know what reality is and you but it's, it's ineffable. You can't talk about it. It's not, you can't even quote unquote use it really. It's just there. It's here all the time. So, so you're all suddenly cast right back into the world of communicating as if you're a self and an ego and a seeker and all that with a bunch of people that are doing the same thing. Um, and so that part of you never goes away. Of course, that part of your experience of reality is just there. It's always there. Um, but it's sort of just waiting in the background until some of that conditioning starts to drop, more of that conditioning drops, come in contact with the right people, the right situations, and you know, um, and knowingly orient toward what was actually discovered in that moment, even though you can never say it. Hmm. And when you, the more you actually knowingly orient toward that, the more life really starts just looking different. It starts to rearrange itself in strange and bizarre and magical and terrifying ways sometimes. Um, but that's the kind of the emotion work that you have to go through. Uh, and yeah, and, and, and it's, it's such a neat thing to, in one sense, be able to even ex still experience the, the seeker, but only as a thought and seeing how even being around somebody who seeks, you, your, your mind will pick it up. 
you know, it, it's we're empathic creatures, so we pick up other people's physiology. We also pick up their mental processes sometimes. And at some at some point, you start going, "Oh my gosh, that's so interesting. That's not even mine. It's just not. It's just a it's just an interaction with another human being who has a certain emotional pattern, and and the seeking is associated with that in the mind. And my body mind is sort of tuning fork with that. It's kind of cool actually, but it's nothing there. There's no, it doesn't, there's no one to whom that refers at all, and nothing. Nothing, yeah. nothing collating experience anymore at all. It's really cool. It's all just a happening. <laughs> it's like, you know, yeah, uh, yeah it's yeah. just a happening. And, and uh, that, that empathic connection is interesting because you, you do, you do, you, you tune into others. Even when we came back from this last retreat, you know, when I came back and I'm sitting in the car with my daughter who's anxious about middle school, it, you pick it up right away and you feel the anxiety. You feel it where she's probably feeling it. And, you know, the butterflies in the stomach and all of this. And like, what is going on? And uh, mm -hmm. if you're not, if you're not oriented towards it in the way you describe, it qu pretty quickly becomes consciousness seems just kind of conformed in that, and you think you're that. You, oh, I'm anxious. Yeah. And the minute you actually orient to the willingness to see it in that way, it oh, oh, okay, yeah. How interesting is that? Yeah, yeah it becomes a <coughs> movement of fascination where you're just like, oh, wow. And, and, and you feel love. You're like, oh, that's the suffering. She's suffering. Yep. Like, yeah. It's, it's the, it's the beautiful balance between wisdom and, and compassion or wisdom and love. Wi transcendent wisdom, prajna wisdom, meaning, you know, if you lean in too much, you, you can go into delusion yourself. Like you, you're believing the thoughts. And you, and of course, if you believe them, it's already about you. Apparently it feels that way. On the other hand, you can try to lean out too much. If you've had some insight, you've had some some taste of the absolute. You can lean out too much and just go, "Oh, well, that's not happening. No one's. Ha it's not. You know." And and it's a kind of spiritual numbness that you can you can you know use as a bypassing mechanism for a while until you can't do it anymore. But there's a beautiful balance in there where it's like, "Oh yeah, I can." I, it's where the masculine meets the feminine energetically. It's where the disintegrative meets the integrative. I can be her completely right now with her as her as the suffering. And now all of a sudden there's no her, there's no me, there's no car, there's no sky, there's no ground, there's no bodies. And it's perfectly balanced. You know, there's nothing to avoid. There's nothing to deny. There's nothing to heal or cure. Uh, and yet there's no denial of what's happening. It, it's a perfect sharing. And, and that's just, that's love. You know, it's wonderful. Yeah, that's love. That's the perfect middle way. You know, when I, when I talk to medical audiences, I talk about empathy versus compassion sometimes. And, it, and actually you framed it way better than ever I could, which is the empathy is being, the pure empathy, affective empathy is just being lost in the sauce of that emotion state and believing it as real in that sense and uh, going that full end of the spectrum. And that can cause you to get burned out because you're bringing the emotion home and it can cause you to act in a way that's uh, short term and unproductive for that person. Whereas stepping out in a fully detached way is actually not great either because the person can feel, the patient can feel, your colleague can feel that you're checked out and you're just like, mm -hmm. uh-huh, yeah, oh, it must be very hard for you. Uh, yeah. But really all this is an illusion because <laughs> it's all just emptiness yeah. manifest. But that perfect balance where it's true compassion, it's unconditional, but at the same time, very embodied, very personal. It's paradoxical. It's like you say, mm -hmm. and and yeah. the, that is inexhaustible and uh, does not burn you out. Does not cause that degree of suffering. And actually, is is something that we're all, I think, looking for, but we don't know it when we're looking yeah. for a relationship with a healthcare person or with our patients. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's this one taste, or maybe a, a way of saying it is. There's there's not there's not a there's not a uh, identified discrimination, mm -hmm. meaning uh, it doesn't matter what happens next. It doesn't matter what face is in front of me next or what situation, whether I'm with people or not with people, whether I'm with a person I'm emotionally connected to or a total stranger, even whether I'm with someone I like or don't like, it doesn't actually matter. The, the, the natural movement is one of, of compassion essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, and, and that's what really this comes down to in the end. That's what it's really all about. But the insight is critical because you can fool yourself and think you're compassionate and think you're a good person and hide a lot of stuff from yourself without that insight. Yeah, I think yeah. we're good at that in healthcare for sure. Uh, we're good at that mm -hmm. as humans at hiding that stuff. Um, yeah. the, the other thing I noticed, Angelo, is after that event, it was much more difficult to, like emotions became very difficult. I found myself very volatile. Uh, I would swing back and forth between these kind of very present uh, equanimous states and just pure reactivity. And that continues actually, although it's gotten more, um, 
I have more insight into it now where I'm able to look at it and go, oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's uh, anger or, you know, uh, that sort of thing. And I get lost less often, but it's been a decade now since that thing had, it was 2012 when that mm -hmm. shift happened and, and it's still this kind of unfolding. You know, I remember Adya Shanti saying, he had a little voice in his head saying, this is not it. Like you need to keep going. Like this is not everything. It very, I mean, the, the deepest intuition, even the superficial intuition say that's exactly right. Uh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. That's that's quite typical. This this sort of shadow material comes up, and I might call it the the sort of flip flopping that happens after awakening, or the um, the fluctuation, or it can even feel like a roller coaster at times, where it's like you go from feeling absolute presence, undeniable, without a doubt, no problems. There are no problems. Never have been. Never could be. And you know it, and you feel it. And then the next day, like something pisses you off or whatever. You're triggered. You feel intense emotions. Um, or, or just a lot of thoughts. Sometimes, sometimes the thought storms come, and and that what what I what I have kind of concluded about this, and I tell people is, it's pretty lawful. It just sort of has to be that way. You, the, the uh, maybe you could say the body mind needs the contrast to sort this out. You kind of have to go back and forth to see like, well, where is the the trigger point of suffering, and then once it starts to calm a little bit, you've done some emotion work, um, you've learned good emotional coping mechanisms that are more direct experience rather than um, covering things up and rationalizing and escape and all that, um, then then you can start looking for the really, really subtle, uh, um, I, I might call them triggers, but they're actually beliefs about reactivity and, and so forth. And then, mm -hmm. uh, you know, equanimity can come online where it's, it's strangely like, neutral is not the right word for equanimity. It's, the best way I can just say it is whatever happens, it's already the right thing to happen. There's not something back here trying to decide whether it's good for me or bad for me anymore. It's just like, this is just perfectly fine. This is what's happening. Even strangely, even if I know it's uncomfortable, I can knowingly feel something uncomfortable, but there doesn't have to be resistance to it. It's strange. It's, it's, that's another paradoxical thing, but, um, but yeah, I mean, you're, you're working right out at that, at that you're shifting into that. I can tell. So, um, yeah, I mean, anything else to add? Yeah. You know, the one, one thing I will add is, and I only am realizing this now, probably because my insight is not great. Looking back in the couple of years after this shift, and I started getting really into, uh, you know, reading a lot about kind of secular spirituality, uh, meditation, kind of the idea of no self and, and this kind of thing as conceptual stuff, but then practicing meditation for the first time. Um, the spiritual ego and the kind of idea of spiritual bypass comes online very fast, meaning you start talking to your friends and your family like, hey, you know, it's all an illusion. Like everything is mm -hmm. emptiness. It just form is emptiness, emptiness. You're quoting all this stuff yeah. and you're, um, and, and you're, and they'll tell you, you're a real asshole or like, you're not my guru, shut up or whatever it is. And you're like, yeah. then you're all, then you're all defensive. You're like, well, you're just, you know, you need to just meditate more, man. And it's a real phenomenon. Uh, yeah. it, uh, you, and without insight, you just think, ah, oh, and, uh, looking back, I'm like, oh, I definitely, definitely was doing that. And, and again, yeah. I didn't even, I don't even know what awakening is. I don't like what that event was. I don't know, but I just felt like, oh, I just, I can see that this is, you mm -hmm. know, this way. So why can't you see it? And in reality, it's just more belief and story and ego around, yeah. around attainment. Yeah. yeah. Totally. It's, it's a phenomenon that happens to most every, most people to some degree or another will go through that sort of Zen stink phase, yeah. but, but it's also, it also can be a teacher too, that there's what you're saying to someone in, in that way. It's not wrong. It's just not completely right. It's not well calibrated and That's the timing right. is off and you, you don't have a deep enough instinct to know about timing and that sort of thing and to read people well and see when they're actually asking you for help and when they're, they're just in a bad mood or whatever. But the, the lesson underneath it all, I think at least one of the lessons, uh, probably the central lesson is what you're really saying in those moments, but you don't know it is you're saying, hey, I need you to wake up because I can't stand the fact that I have no control now over the fact that I have to empathize with everything that's going on in you. <laughs> I can't make a separation anymore at all. And it's really uncomfortable that I feel your frustration. So wake up, damn it. And they're like, fuck you. Yeah. Right. And that's, and that's good. When, you, when If you start to regard everyone and everything as Buddha nature, meaning the most the person you think is the most deluded, they're also unfiltered reality staring you right in the face and everything is waking you up. So when they tell you, hey, back off, 
oh, okay, maybe I'm trying to externalize my practice instead of going, oh, maybe I'm the one that could, could do some more inquiry. <laughs> maybe I could go sit some more yeah. and, and learn some more compassion and meta practice and stuff. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's a phenomenon that happens and it's fine. But usually if you have good friends and family, they'll be like, hey, you're, you're just being a dick now. Now you're a spiritual dick. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, yeah. And the only other thing I'll say is like, again, like I think there are a lot of people who've had these shifts that I think don't know what they are. And there's so much more realization that can happen afterwards if you really open to it. And the emotion work is the one that is so confusing for people who don't have a vessel for it because they just think, why am I so reactive? Why do I feel less awake than before this thing, less enlightened, like more angry, more reactive? And it's all the things he said. Yeah. So it leaves me with two last questions about this. One is, if you were to, to give someone advice who, who just went through some crazy transformation, they don't know what it is, maybe, maybe they do whatever, but they're just coming out of it, right? Um, what, what might you tell them in retrospect from your own experience that could maybe soften the landing or something? Yeah, there's a couple things. One is don't try to make sense of this. Don't try to, if you, if you have a big spiritual background, you're going to be like, oh, I had a Ken show and uh, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. And the, the mind will just put labels on something that's absolutely unlabelable. It, it's ineffable. And you should rest in that complete unknowing of it. Just be like, I don't know what this is. It's just, just this. And just surrender to that as long as you can. The other thing is I was lucky in that I was in a place where I was told by my boss, Tony, to just allow yourself in these next few months to just expose yourself to all kinds of things. So when this happened, I was in a wide open state to do that. So I didn't feel rushed or forced and, and jammed back into complicity with the sort of thought world as quickly. And that helped, but it did, it did come back eventually uh, and made it uh, a little bit tough. So if you can carve yourself some space to just be, you know, um, as alone with, how do I say this? To be, <laughs> just to be, without feeling pulled back into this sort of complicit thought world, that can really allow a, a, a much more integration. It's not even integration, because there's nothing to integrate. It's just this. I mean, even now looking back, it's like, it just unfolded, right? And then I think um, finding people who have either been through something like this or who can understand it. Because if you say, sometimes family dynamics can be difficult. They weren't for me, but I think sometimes family dynamics can be so difficult that there are people in your family that are maybe very reactive or they, they have their own stuff they're working through and they see you come at them with this kind of way of being and they're gonna try to project onto you all the things and you're gonna be wide open empathic, you're gonna feel it and it's gonna be very confusing at the minimum. So trying to be at least aware of that if you can't avoid it um, might be good. Um, yeah, but but for me, it was kind of nice not knowing anything about this. It, it just allowed a, um, an unfolding that was more natural and felt less conceptual because I had no even idea of how to conceptualize it beyond I was on drugs and now I'm not mm -hmm. and I'm still I'm feeling amazingly, I don't know what. I love it. I think that's excellent advice. Um, one more question, one last question, unless there's anything else you want to add. So someone who's been listening to this, um, interest it's on my channel, so it's going to be people who are interested in awakening or have gone through it, but someone who's interested in it hasn't, hasn't really had that shift yet, um, or they're reasonably certain they haven't. Um, but they're interested in it. They're interested in what we're talking about this, this mysterious, you know, possibility. Um, what, what might you tell them? If you're interested in this and you're feeling that pull, and I realized that I was feeling the pull, I just couldn't make it explicit. Why did I leave my job? Why did I go to Vegas? It wasn't just because I was burned out and unhappy and I thought I was gonna fix healthcare. I realized now in retrospect, there was this deep intuitive knowing that probably had come from those glimpses when I was young, that there's something there that is a deeper truth and living authentically means manifesting that truth. And anything that feels really inauthentic is just, uh, it's almost like it's an unnatural, it's a crime against that truth, <laughs> although you can't commit a crime against that truth because everything is that truth, but it just feels that way. And, and so there's something drawing you to this. So you can honor that and go, you know what? I'm so lucky I feel drawn to this. Just throw yourself into it. 
don't see it as something you're gonna accomplish. Just go, there's a mystery here and at the center of this, and that mystery is right here, right now in this moment. It's, it, ba- you're bathing in it. Remember those old palm olive uh, commercials where she had the the, the soap and she's, and she's like, but palm olive, where's that? And she's, and, and she's like, you're soaking in it, dear. And it's like, oh my God, it's awakening. It's right here. <laughs> it's always been right here. So that paradoxically just takes the stress off and then, you know, read Angela's book. <laughs> That's really it. It's such a beautiful guide to this. That's the best advice I could give. Man, that is, that, I think that's, that's really good. And, and I like how you just gave a, a sort of taste of it. That's the, that's the key. It's just taste it, taste it again, taste it again, find what works for you, find the book, the teacher, the videos, whatever it is that gives you those tastes. And as you said, don't make a project out of it. Don't think you understand. It's nothing like you think. It's nothing like that. Don't get too obsessed with doctrine. It'll just confuse you. Give yourself to it and feel feel that pull and give yourself to it and be willing to be surprised and maybe go through a major fear barrier. Maybe be really, really high with a billionaire in a closet and a sorceress in the middle of Las Vegas. I mean, you know, it can happen all different ways. So Pretty, you know... When Dr. Evil talked about his own history, he said, my story is quite unremarkable, actually. I, there was, I was the son of a billionaire and a sorceress with webbed feet. <laughs> <laughs> with that, I cannot think of a better way to conclude. Man, I really appreciate you taking the time to do this interview. Uh, it's just, it's been a blast. Maybe we can do something like this again um, where I'm interviewing you because usually it's the other way around, but uh, it's been great. It's so wonderful for me. Like I feel every time you talk, I, 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 yeah, it's indescribable. So (laughs) I just love it. It's like a, a 12 day retreat in a, in an hour for me. So thank you. Thank you.